Hello, and welcome to another edition of Your Therapist Needs Therapy, the podcast where two mental health professionals talk about their mental health journeys and how they navigate mental wellness while working in the mental health field. I'm your host, Jeremy Schumacher, licensed marriage and family therapist. To support the show, you can head over to patreon.com slash wellnesswithjare. That's always super appreciated. Likes and shares are also appreciated. Today, I am joined by owner and operator of Nova Mental Health Services, Taylor Clark. Taylor. Hi. Thanks thanks for for joining me. me. Uh, I always start with the same question, Taylor, which is, how did you get into the mental health field? Yeah, so um, I was trying to figure out, like, in high school, like, you know, what I wanted to go to school for and such, and I took, like, an AP psych class, which I think is a journey a lot of people go on, (laughs) Um, and I was like, well, this is really interesting, so I wanted to, you know, um, do psychology, so I went to school, started doing that. And my mom, who's a high school counselor and one of her friends is a social worker, she was like, she sat me down, she's like, Taylor, what are you doing? She's like, you don't want a PhD, you don't want to go through that, it's so much school. Like, she's like, have you considered social work? I was like, oh, I don't want to do that. I had all these preconceived notions of what social work was, and um, she had her friend, Alma, uh, her, her name was Alma, talk to me, and... After talking to her a little bit, I was like, okay, you know, social work kind of sounds cool, kind of sounds expansive, you know, like if if I go through this program and, you know, I want to do therapy and then I don't want to do therapy. There's other tracks and such for me. Um, So that's what I did and I ended up really loving the perspective that um, the social work program takes, which is looking not just at like, okay, you have a mental health disorder and looking at your brain, but looking at all that comes into that, the biology of it, the social implications, the political implications. Yeah. Um, I just found it, it just felt like such a right fit for me. Um, so yeah, that's kind of the short and sweet of how I, how I kind of got into it. Um, yeah. Yeah. Awesome. I, um, <laughs> this is not a thing we talk about on the podcast very often. My dad is also a high school guidance counselor and, um, I think that kept me away from psychology for a while. <laughs> um, he was also my AP psych teacher. So, um, but going into college, like what I thought I was going to do was psychiatry because I thought that's what you did in psychology. And so like, it's again, all the same thing, right? <laughs> right. Having this preconceived notion and then like really needing to kind of fine tune what it was I wanted to do. And like, then even getting into grad school, like what was the population I wanted to work with mm-hmm. and all of that while like not having any experience in the field. So not knowing what it was that I like to do or what I like to work with. Yeah, most definitely. They love um, throwing you into stuff before you even have life experiences. Like, I don't know what I want to do. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. So what was your journey into like college and grad school then? Did you kind of know, hey, I want to work with this population or was it fine tuning and kind of readjusting as you went? Yeah, I think the fine tuning for sure. Um, I think at first I was like, oh, I want to like work with kids. And then I was like, but I don't want to work with teenagers. And, you know, I don't want to work with really heavy stuff like um, sex offenders or anything like that. And then my first job out of college was working with teenagers and adolescents who have sexually offended. Yeah. And I loved it. It challenged me it gave me such a different perspective it wasn't something I wanted to do long term but I feel like you know it really helped me grow as a therapist and to really realize the systematic issues within our society and Mm -hmm. with working um with teenagers and um adolescents who you know have like these early on backgrounds with you know, getting into trouble with the law and, um, a lot of like issues surrounding, surrounding that and how we've failed a lot of these kids within that. Um, so I feel like that was really helpful, but, um, you know, moving on thinking like, okay, you know, what is it that I fully want to do? Another area I thought was I want to do medical social work. So, Mm -hmm. um, I got a job doing that at a community center and it was not a great experience. (laughs) Um, Yeah. I really 
struggled with finding my footing there. Um, I was super excited because it was supposed to be integrated healthcare, which sounded amazing. So I was supposed to be able to work with like the doctors and the right. nurses yeah. to, you know, help these patients. And what ended up happening was they just wanted to put me in the basement and see clients, well, regardless of if they wanted to be seen or not, mm -hmm. medication over the head, that kind of stuff. I was like, no, I'm not doing that. That's, that's not me. Yeah. Um, and it just, it was really bad. I was getting really, really anxious and stressed out and, um, having like some even like minor, like anxiety attacks, like sure. on my yeah. way to work. Yeah. Um, and then one day I just was like, I, I can't do this anymore. I, I got into a disagreement with HR where they were, you know, telling me like, Hey, you need to do this. You need to do that. And I'm like, I'm going to be honest. If I had a client who told me that this is what their job was telling them, obviously I wouldn't tell them that they have to leave their job. Cause you know, like we <laughs> right. don't do that. But like, I would be talking with them. Like, have you considered leaving your position? Yeah. Because that's where this is at. And that day I actually signed up for my own LLC. <laughs> Yeah. It's like, I don't know what I'm doing. I talked to um, my boyfriend, now, now, now my husband, but my time boyfriend. And I was like, is this crazy? I don't know if this is crazy, but I'm going to go ahead and do this. And yeah. um, he was very supportive of me on that aspect. <laughs> and yeah, I was like, what was it that I needed? Like when I was thinking like I'm a specialty, I was like, what? And it was actually a podcast and stuff that I listened to to yeah. kind of help me like figure out how to have a private practice and that kind of stuff. And I was yes. like, what is it? And they were talking about a lot about like your, your, your niche, like yeah. niche, niche. Your, yeah. Yeah. You know. I say it every single different way. Yeah. And your and ideal, <laughs> ideal client, finding your ideal yeah, client. Yeah, your ideal client. I was mm -hmm. like, what was it that I needed as, as a kid when I was younger? And that was, I wasn't diagnosed with ADHD until I was in my mid twenties Yeah. and I was previously misdiagnosed, um, when I was younger. So like, it was kind of, you know, there, like I had like some help, but it wasn't help that worked because it was the wrong diagnosis. Yeah. Um, and then I was like, so I, you know, I like to, you know, maybe help people who have like ADHD or other neurodiversities and mm. then. Also, with the LGBT community, I am bi, and again, I didn't come out until I was older. Yeah. Um, I grew up in a very small town. My parents are wonderful people. They've always taught, like, you know, like, taught diversity and inclusion, and so, like, I was always like, yeah, I'm such an ally to the LGBT community, but I didn't really know what it meant to be bi, because mm -hmm. my small town, like, when people would talk about bi people in my high school, it was this very narrow minded capacity. I was like, Oh, well that's not, that, that that's not me. Like when I heard what bi people were, I'm like, that's not me. Sure. And it actually wasn't until like an episode, sorry, I'm tangenting a bit ADHD. Yeah. <laughs> this is why I get ADHD people on. Cause like, right? yeah, we just vibe. We vibe. <laughs> yeah. But like, uh, I was watching an episode of Brooklyn nine, nine. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if you've ever seen that, but there's a character named Rosa and, uh, she comes out and she kind of explains, you know, how she identifies as bi and what that meant for her. And it resonated so much for me. And I was like, holy shit. So that, yeah. that is me. That is, that is me. Yeah. Um, so like, yeah, it was just kind of like, what was it that I needed when I was younger? Mm -hmm. And then I realized that there was like a deficit of that in our community, that there weren't, and luckily more and more few places are coming out like that. But um, even five years ago, there just weren't a lot of places that um, met those needs. Yeah. So I was like, great, there's a need here. Something I'm interested in. Yeah. Let's roll. <laughs> and yeah. it's resonated with a lot of people. Yeah. Yeah. Um... That's so fascinating. I, I didn't get my ADHD diagnosis till I was 22 or 23. I was in the last mm -hmm. year of my postgrad, which I like to joke is like the dumbest time to get a diagnosis when I'm finishing school. Um, but even like how I related it to my diagnosis took a long time because I didn't see someone, my the person who did my diagnosis at that time. Like I went in and told them I'm ADHD. Like I already knew it. I yeah. was in the field, but like I wanted. You're a therapist. You're like here. Here's the DSM five. Right. Here's here's the ones that I meet. I wanted <laughs> I wanted why. the person with the the PsyD to officially tell me I had ADHD, 
which they did. But like, it took me so long to really like unpack and relate to it. Um, part of my journey was also stepping away from organized religion. And like, that's really when I was like, holy shit, like this affects a lot more than I thought it did. Um, but I, I do think getting diagnosed later in life, like it gives you this opportunity, um, kind of this like grief or like looking back and being like, man, it would have been nice if I got my diagnosis earlier, oh my God, yeah. <laughs> but also knowing what it looks like and having that lived experience for people who are masking or people who are compensating in other ways. I see so many adults who are in their late twenties or early thirties. And I'm like the first person who's telling them, I think you have ADHD. I was like, no, cause like I did good in school or like, no, cause of this. And I was it's like, like running around the classroom as a kid, like right. spacing on, staring out the window. We have this, we have this very narrow view. And I think uh, honestly, as um, clinicians too, there's that narrow view that like of what gets diagnosed early in life. Mm-hmm. And if you don't fit that narrow range, it's going to get missed. Yeah, exactly. And I think like, since especially with being a female like yes when i was younger they were like well she's not running around like crazy and that kind of thing so um and you know her grades aren't good that kind of thing so we think it's you know the specific learning disorder sure but it just didn't quite make sense because for some reason my specific learning disorder for like reading we'll say uh went away when i was really interested in bu- in a book <laughs> sure <laughs> um, like, yeah it's like, I was like, oh, that's not how that works. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All of a sudden, you don't become really good at reading with a specific learning disorder simply because you like a book. So, yeah. Um, it just, it was actually my first time I thought of it was in my psychology class. Like, I was like, oh, that's interesting. That sounds a lot like me. And then people are like, you don't have ADHD. And, you know. Yeah. I also, I mean, I went to, I was in parochial religious schools, so like not mental health forward thinking at all. But in that like time in the 90s where um, so many people were getting diagnosed that there was then this like pendulum swing mm-hmm. the other direction where like we didn't want to diagnose people because everybody had the diagnosis. It's like, yep, we've learned that like, yes, everyone's always had the ADHD or the neurodiversity. And it's just that we've gotten better at actually telling who has it and who doesn't um, and finding those people. But like, yeah, still a very... I think narrow and, and limited range. I think my perspective, the longer been in the field has shifted to towards having therapists who share your lived experience. And so having mm-hmm. working with clients who have ADHD, I think it's really helpful for them when I share my experience, not that, that I overshare, but being able to relate and say like, right, this is how I deal with that. Or this is how I navigated this. This is what it looked like for me before I got my diagnosis and after mm-hmm normalizes so much of it as opposed to like that stigma or that like oh there must be something bad about me because of this diagnosis oh and also seeing that like oh like you can have this diagnosis and being a successful person and you know um it's it's sometimes even the thing that makes you great you know not and i'm very careful with that because i also think we can either go oh my god this is a horrible diagnosis or oh wow it's like a superpower and you know it can be a good thing if you have the resources and the support to back (laughs) it up. If not, it can feel like it's the worst thing that you've ever been, like you could have ever thought of. Um, so like, I'm like, you know, find that balance between, I'm like, no, this is not, you know, toxic positivity surrounding it. And this is also not doom and gloom. Like, um, we can work through this. We can find ways like, and you know, your normal, your thing that might really work for you. Other people might find it a little strange, but the people who don't get it won't get it. And the people who do really get it and really find you. And that's how you find your people. Yeah. So. Yeah. What, this wasn't a question I was planning on asking. <laughs> um, but what, what's your experience um, specializing in this and, and marketing yourself as this? So finding clients with like the rise of TikTok and some of the like, I'm going to specify the autism community, mm-hmm. um, not not people with autism, but the the online autism community and like a lot of the memes of like, if you like chicken nuggets, you have autism <laughs> and some of that stuff. So so what what's kind of been your experience of like, hey, it's great. Um, well, let me, yes, let me hear your, I, I hear your answer to the what question. Saying, what's yeah, your like experience? The balance on? between like, well, this is great. This is like getting out there and people are learning more about it and also, okay, People are like, oh my God, I re- only eat chicken nuggets on Tuesdays. I must be autistic. Something yeah. like that. And like, you know. Um, so like, first of all, I used to specialize. I don't necessarily like, especially with neurodiversity. And this is just my opinion. Um, saying specialize because like, I 
it feels a little icky to specialize in a demographic. Sure. Uh, yeah. Uh, for me personally, like, I think it depends how you like define it within your own systems. But within mine, I just say like we have a special focus, like mm-hmm. versus specialization. Uh, especially things like autism and ADHD, we're still learning so much about it that yeah. like what we could be talking about right now in 10 years, we could look back at this podcast and be like, oh my gosh, we were so off about <laughs> that. Um, but going back to like the TikTok thing, mm-hmm. um, I think just TikTok in general, it can be a source of really great information and great source for misinformation yeah so i think that when people are looking on tiktok and they're resonating with things like that's great and i also do believe that like if you don't have the resources to get self-diagnosed or to get diagnosed that self-diagnosis can be valid if it helps you one thing about um having a neurodiversity perspective is we know that the things that work like coping skills, strategies that work for neurodivergent people work for people who aren't neurodivergent as well. Mm -hmm. So if someone's like, Hey, this resonates a lot with me. I don't know if I have this diagnosis or not. Um, and I'm, I, but I don't want to take up space, do it, take up that space. As long as you're not like inserting yourself as like, Hey, I'm the professional of this. Right. Right. Or, you know, like being like for me, my personal journey, these things I saw on TikTok really helped me. That's great. That's wonderful. I think when it becomes a problem is when people take their their experiences or even share experiences that they have with maybe a few other people in the community and they're like, this is a diagnosis criteria. Yeah. Or this is, it's like, there's a difference between shared experience and, a, and you know, what's in the DSM. And what is in the DSM is not what it... <laughs> yes, the DS- it's problematic in itself. <laughs> TikTok is uh, not the be all end all source of information. Neither is the DSM. No. Uh, but yeah, kind of similar to what you said, where like ADHD isn't doom and gloom diagnosis, but it also isn't a superpower. I think there's exactly. a lot of middle ground space for like I think community building and connection and normalization that happens on social media is really helpful. Mm-hmm. And yeah, I think people, there's a lot of gatekeeping that can happen in the community and there's a lot of um, oversimplification for a thing that's really complex. And yeah, I, think I think that that's can a good be way to put it. Unhelpful when it gets too rigid or dogmatic. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it, is, it is fascinating to have clients come in and know all the information they know <laughs> about it that wasn't what it looked like at the start of my career uh, by any stretch of the imagination oh especially honestly i love working with my autistic clients because like half time when they come in they're like kind of like how you and i are with their well, like i was like hey i'm pretty sure i'm adhd let me walk through with you like i yeah. love like autistic clients who are like hey i'm pretty sure i'm autistic <laughs> let me tell you why here's my list and then yep. i'm like yeah, you are, you know, maybe, but let's consider this first, you know, but like most of the time, especially I'm like, like they'll come in. I'm like, that's a lot of information you've gathered. seems like you took really a lot of time to think about this. Let's pull this together. And sometimes just with the information they have yeah. you can diagnose. And I think that's even really valid, like validating for like clients because like you have like medical doctors where they'll do the same thing and they're like, you don't know anybody. You silly. You don't, right. right. Like the medical gaslighting that happens. Yes. Like, I know my body. Yeah. And that's what I tell my clients. Like I'm a professional in this field, but you know, you, you're right. the professional of yourself. So we work together to help you. Yeah. Yeah. And that, like, I don't like the word expert, but um, talking about, like, we might be an expert in psychology, but our clients are experts in their own lives. Yeah. And so it's not, it's, it's not hierarchical. It needs to be, how do we make those expertises mesh together and work in a way that's helpful as opposed to all pointed one direction where someone's telling the other person what to do. Like, that's not good, healthy therapy. Exactly. Um, so I'm going to backtrack a little bit. Uh, opening your own practice. I love the ADHD version of it too um, because mine, I think I opened in like a week, which isn't what I recommend for people. Um, but wow, that's fast. <laughs> but similarly, like really, really um, working at a place that was not a good fit. Um, I had been in the profession for long enough where I kind of knew what I was looking for and what I wasn't, but like I needed a, I think I needed a bad boss so that I finally mm-hmm. got like, I could do this. 
because I think so much of what my neurodivergence looked like was like spreadsheets and being organized and filling out LLC paperwork and what's an escort like all of that seemed really to not make sense to my brain that's not how my brain organizes information so I just sort of assumed I could not do the business side of it and I think working for a boss who was um, maybe good at business but bad at a lot of the other things like gave me the confidence to be like you know what I could do this better just doing it myself yeah. and I kind of needed I don't know it's silver lining to say I needed a bad boss to open my own place. But like it did give me the confidence, I think, to then be able to be like, I'm going to open my own place and I'll figure out all this escort shit. And but like it'll be ethical. It'll be aligned mm -hmm. to my values and I'll be practicing in a way that fits for how I want to practice and see the clients that I want to see. Yeah, exactly. And so I'm curious, like similar experience. How was navigating the business side of things? You talk about listening to podcasts and gathering information. Like, what was it for you to kind of say, like talking to your support system being like, is this crazy? But then like, what was it when you kind of opened the doors and, and started doing actually doing the work? Yeah. So I opened up my practice in November, 2019. <laughs> so we all know what happened a few months later. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So I started, I was like, okay, I'm just going to do one step at a time, which, you know, it's really hard with ADHD because you just kind of want to go for it. But I was like, if I'm going to do this, I need to do this one step at a time. I don't do five-year plans. People be like, what's your five-year plan? I'm like, that's not how this works because the things that I thought would take me years to do, I ended up doing within a few months or within a year. Yeah. And the things I was like, oh, I think I can do this. Thing next some of that stuff I still haven't done yet like I just don't have the capacity to figure out how long something is going to take very well yes so I was like that's not what I'm gonna do I, I have ideas and things that I want to do and I'll do one step and when I feel comfortable in there we'll take the next step plus you know helps with that dopamine because you're like feeling a little bored over here let's add something else right yes. um so I started off I was like I'm just gonna do myself like just buy my lonesome, got a little place in Waukesha and was like, I want to do telehealth. It was something I really wanted to do at my last practice, but, um, they kept being like, no, no, no. I'm making up excuses of why they couldn't do it. Mm -hmm. Uh, fun fact when COVID came around, I was talking to someone who still worked there and they were scrambling I'm like, interesting. <laughs> <laughs> we could have um, been ahead of this. Yeah. Cause I started up, uh, with telehealth and everything. And when COVID happened, I was able to calmly explain to my clients Hey, we're going to switch to telehealth. This is how it works. Here's yep. the risks and benefits of it. Yeah. And I think I maybe lost two clients because of COVID, which from what I was hearing from other people was like insanely good. Yeah. So we just went to telehealth for a while. And then um, it's like, you know, things are doing really well here. I don't know if I'm ready to like be a boss, but maybe I'm ready to be a supervisor for mm -hmm. like interns. So I partnered with like UWM to be a field liaison and got my first intern. I was like, oh, I really like this. I've always liked that teaching aspect. I don't want to be a full-time teacher, but I do like, you know, teaching and educating and everything. And all of a sudden, you know, things kept building. And now I have 11 people between therapists and interns and um, like we call her our client here care manager mm -hmm. so she's the one who does like the intakes and helps match people up and stuff yeah um so <laughs> all of that happened really fast yeah um so yeah it's it was definitely i'm not a i don't have a business degree i say my business degree is through google <laughs> and you know my my husband does so yeah. like i'd ask him questions on sometimes with how to like run the business but for the most part like it's trial and error there's mistakes that I've definitely made where, you know, I've had to like scramble to figure out how to fix it. And I did. And I yeah. think, you know, being a business owner really helps you figure out how resilient and scrappy you are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm like, right. The reality of like being able to, if you make mistakes, clean them up and still be able to work mm. through it. Like there's a lot of, I think, black and white thinking that, that neurodivergent folks deal with and that isn't necessarily how it works owning your own business. And I think I'm, I'm far more, when I talk to younger therapists or people who are starting out in their career, I'm far more open about like pros and cons for owning your own practice, which was just not a thing that people really presented to me when I was mm -hmm. coming up, when I was in school, when I was interning, like it was, 
you worked for a hospital or you worked for private practice, but at an agency and it wasn't really ever like, here's how you can go open your own place and be successful with that. Yeah. In fact, that's actually something that's on my wish list is I want to be able to like, um, do like a course or something on that one day is like, this is how you open up your own practice. Yeah. Like, um, in general, I've always told my, you know, my interns or even my staff, cause I believe that you treat your stuff well to make them want to stay, but you expect that they're going to go off and do bigger and better things. Right. Like, so I always say like, you know, as much as I want to keep you on, like if you ever do open up your own practice or something and you ever want to talk to me about it, I would love to do that. Yeah. You know, um, sometimes it's not supportive. I've known people who've owned private practices where when people left their private practice, they're like, hey, I want to start this. And they're like, good luck with that. Yeah. Like it's which is, I think, insane because when there's places that have six month waiting lists. Right. It's not like we're really competing. Yeah. There's that's... plenty. There's plenty of need for therapists in the world that we can support each other. <laughs> yeah. That scarcity mindset or that yeah. competition mindset where it's like the reality is there's far more clients who need therapists than therapists to serve them. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that was part of, I mean, when I, I had decided to leave my practice, but then my, then, uh, not even boss cause I was an independent contractor. Um, but like tried to take all my clients and it was mm-hmm. just like, that's what went from like, I would have taken my time and opened my practice to like, I opened in a week because, <laughs> um, it got really aggressive really fast, but it's just one of those things where it's like, right. It wasn't a supportive mm-hmm. environment. It was viewed as competition and, now that I own my own practice, like I love connecting with people, like the podcast is how I connect with people and networking and stuff. Like that's my yeah. referral list, not just where I can get clients, but where I can send people that I'm not a good fit for. Like exactly. building that network and that community not only helps our clients, but it helps us as professionals. And so, yes, I've never understood the competitive or the scarcity mindset mm-hmm. around mental health. No, not at all. I'm like, this is a small community. Probably going to see each other like the amount of times I've like ran into people or like, pe- you know, you're working something and, oh, hey, I used to work with you. Like, right. this is a small community within itself that, yeah, I just think that we need to be more supportive of each other and see each other as tool, like as like resource tools and not as competition. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. Small walkie is like yeah. not a phrase that I love, but a lot of people bring it up just because like you run in, you do, you run into people, you run into clients, you run into former clients. Like, Oh, and then you work in the narrow queer community and it's even smaller. Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah. Let's talk about, let's talk about that. Neuro is my favorite. That's how I identify. Yeah. Um, that's <laughs> my, my favorite phrase. I, I believe uh, the first time I saw it was Dr. Uh, Nick Walker's book, Neuro Queer Heresies, mm-hmm. um, which I really liked. And I think, is a really good book. I strongly recommend that people read it. But um, just that idea, like that overlap between sexuality, orientation, um, gender expression, and being neurodivergent, like it's hard when you're neurodivergent to like lock into a certain box Mm -hmm. and like feel that it fits you or that you fit it. Yeah. I also think that there's this wonderful like thought process with a lot of neurodivergent people where we just don't necessarily, if something doesn't make sense in our society, we're like, why? Like, yeah. Why, why would I hide who I am? I spent way too much time, like, you know, being confused about who I was and being neurodivergent and everything. Now that I figured this out, why would I not tell people? Right. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. I think I, I talk about it a lot as like growing up, trying to learn how to fit in. And then Mm. as an adult, learning how to undo all that, (laughs) trying so hard to fit in. So hard. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Um, what was, I mean, how have you experienced kind of as a business owner and marketing yourself that way? Like, how has that worked from, from the perspective of like you as a practitioner? I mean, I think that people gravitate towards authenticity. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, being authentically myself, like you said, like not oversharing or anything like that, but like being authentically yourself, like, um, people really like that both clients and people who come to work with me and interns interns sure. and such like I have so many people who want to intern here or like you know and, and, and it feels like weird because I don't like <laughs> I don't like it feels like bragging but it's 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 just for what people have told me that yeah. like they're like you know I really appreciate working here because mm-hmm. like I say that at our practice like 
Um, anywhere else, like neurotypicalism is the standard. It's the expectation. But at our practice, neurodiversity is. Yeah. So like um, as much as we can control the environment to be like um, positive for like neurodivergent people, um, whether it's light adjustments or, you know, what mm-hmm. have you. Um, egg chairs, all that kind of stuff. Like we try to make it like a comfortable environment and it works out really well for my team and for myself and for my clients. So I think that, you know, when I really found, okay, this is what I want to do. This is who I want to work with. Um, and like you said, like it, even though I think you can work with people, you know, who maybe like you don't have a lot in common with Mm -hmm. it's more fluid and more natural to work with people that you have shared experiences with yeah so it's interesting even like as i grow like um like as i became a mom in april and that kind of thing and like already like um like thinking about like those experiences as a mom and like i'm sure that is going to play an effect of like who i see as clients in the future as well yeah for sure um I think just allowing that fluidity and that growth and that authenticity um, is what has made my practice successful. Yeah. Where sometimes you're told it's going to be the opposite. (laughs) Yes. The number one feedback I got in grad school was that I was not professional enough. Mm -hmm. And I like, I bring that up kind of as this chip on my shoulder still, because like really everything I have done in my own, in my career since graduating and post-grad and all, finishing school was like showing up genuinely and authentically for people has always worked better than trying to be like a suit and tie kind of person. Oh, the old rigidity style that they still teach. And I think they're slowly (laughs) starting to move away from it. But like the, you have to go in there and use like Mr. or Mrs. last name and like, and then they can tell you and you have to sit like nice and rigid. And I'm like, that's not who I am. First of all, my back's going to hurt after a while if I don't sit crisscross <laughs> in the chair. Um, yeah. And yeah. it's just, maybe that works for some people. I, I've had clients who have come to me and they've wanted that. Mm-hmm. And I'm more than happy to refer them to someone who is going to be like that. That is totally okay. Yeah. But um, that's just not who I am. Right. And trying to be someone else isn't going to benefit my clients and it's not going to benefit me. Yeah. Because... You know, you can kind of read bullshit from a mile away. Yeah. I, I say, like, clients pick up on, um, like, they have a BS radar that, mm-hmm. that they can pick up on. Uh, I used to work a lot with teens, and I, I thought it was just specific to teens. I think teens' BS radar is very good. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but I do think everyone has it, and I think clients pick up on it. I think sometimes um, clients are uncomfortable if their preconceived notions of what therapy looks mm-hmm. like don't fit what what we're presenting but i also think just like what you said like you learn when you have a good referral network like it is not a hassle to refer yeah. someone out if they're not a good fit yeah exactly um but that scarcity mindset can kick in where we feel like we need to see everyone yeah and like help it, everyone it also plays within ourselves too we're yeah. like no i can't refer out like what if they don't get the help that they need and it's like <laughs> yeah yeah and i think that's really important with like building community and, and making those connections then exactly um Working with neurodiversity and the LGBTQ plus community, I mean, it's a weird time. I'm curious how you kind of navigate this in your practice where I do think there's a lot of um, normalizing and there's a lot of community building that's available that wasn't available 5, 10, 15 years ago, Um, especially with like gender nonconforming folks, trans folks, um, the plus in the LGBTQ plus community who don't necessarily fit a label, but also have that neurodiversity piece with it. I think it's really great that they can find community, but also it's really scary time politically Mm -hmm. and kind of aware for um, losing rights or being, um, I will say oppressed, intentionally oppressed uh, politically often. So what do you kind of, I'm, I'm curious if you're seeing that with clients and how you're kind of navigating with that almost like dichotomy between Socially, it's more accepting, but also politically, it's a really scary time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for sure. We work with a lot of people who are who identify as um, somewhere underneath that like trans, non-binary umbrella, mm-hmm. and it's hard because you know politically, there's a lot of things that are being said, and you know sometimes you just have to like sit with clients because we can't fix it. We can be like, well, this is what we do to fix like 
what are you going to do? <laughs> like, yeah. other than, like, vote and, you know, like, make yourself known. You can make phone calls and that kind of stuff. Like, right. you can talk about that, but, like... But you and your client aren't going to change the Supreme Court in session. Yeah, focusing <laughs> on the things that are outside, like, reali- recognizing things that are, like, outside of our control or when they are in our control a little bit, like, utilizing those if that's what you want. Like, let's identify those, but really where I see a lot of hurt and a lot of processing is not so much what the politicians are saying, but what their family is reiterating from these yeah. polit- politicians mm-hmm. and from these world leaders. Um, right. Cause at the end of the day, like our family were taught, you know, they're, they're the ones who are supposed to be there for you. They love you and support you, but how can you love and support someone when you deny a major part of their identity and who they are? Yeah. And then you're using political figures to back up your bigotry and your hates mm-hmm. towards your child, towards your cousin, towards your um, nibbling. You know, yeah. like it's that's like the thing that I see a lot. Like, yeah, we have people come out with political anxiety for sure, but it's more how how their family is using that to like exacerbate like their. Um, yeah. <laughs> intensify yeah. their their feelings towards this and to like use as a justification of why they don't support or what have you yeah yeah i've seen a lot of uh it's just been trending on social media the past couple of days that like when you speak poorly about women in power the women don't hear it but your daughter your wife exactly. your niece you, the people in your life are hearing mm-hmm. it you're not changing the system but you are affecting your kind of the phrase I use is sphere of influence, like the people who are in your direct circles. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And I think it has, you know, I, I work with religious trauma a lot. And so a lot of people that I see are leaving high control religion, kind of deconstructing mm-hmm. is, is the phrase that gets used a lot. And like you deconstruct a lot of your political identity too. And, oh, yeah. and seeing, you mentioned the political and, and being aware of political and systems because working with um, at risk youth or uh, offender youth youth who have offended in some way like you see that some of this is systemic i think for a lot of the clients that i'm working with like they're kind of just starting to see some of that i think the rise of of trump in 2016 and then the politicalization of a global pandemic like Mm -hmm. covid brought a lot of this stuff to the surface for people and they're kind of still picking up the pieces in some cases yeah exactly it's it it can be heavy sometimes (laughs) yeah yes the supreme court is my I'm very open with, with my clients. I'm like, yeah, that's mine. Like, it stresses me out. It makes me mad. I don't have a good solution. Like, sometimes you just need a news detox. But, like, mm-hmm. right, controlling your controllables and trying to put your energy towards something productive or helpful in your own life rather than yeah. rallying think, against the system. Yeah, I think as a therapist, too, we also have to, like, check in with ourselves and, like, are we okay, like, with all the stuff that's been happening. So I a daughter and Mm -hmm. you know me thinking about her future and you know her rights and if anything sometimes it gets me even more mad for these like sometimes I get a little mad for my clients because I'm like things that like people think and say I'm like and that they say to their children and now being a mom I'm like I could never yeah I could never. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like what? Like yeah. your your child is supposed to be the most important thing to you, and you would say that to your child. You wouldn't love and accept them for who they are when they're not harming anybody. Yeah. Like if anything, it's made me more righteously pissed off for <laughs> some people. <laughs> yes, it is interesting. I have a six and a three year old, so yeah, parenting mm-hmm. is. I wouldn't say it's changed how I do therapy, but like the way that I can relate has definitely changed yeah. and, and some of the normalization and insight I can provide. But yeah, and global warming and all that stuff, it's, it's, it hits us as therapists. It affects us as we look at raising our own families and bringing you know, our children up in perhaps a, a worse off world than what we were raised in. Yeah. Yeah. So that's a great segue. <laughs> Uh, what do you do to take care of yourself? Um, you're a new mom, you're balancing, owning a practice, having a caseload, all that stuff. How do you navigate your mental well-being? What do you do to not just take care of your stress level, but also to like have some joy in your life and, and take care of yourself that way? 
Yeah, so I think from the get-go, like, one of the reasons why I wanted my own private practice is because I didn't want to work myself to death. Like, I know that burnout is so real in our field, and a part of that is the heavy, intense caseloads. Mm -hmm. So when I started my private practice, my joke is is I want to, like, have my best European lifestyle. Like, I want to be able to have a good, healthy work-life balance. Like, if I want to go on vacation, I can do that. If I, you know, want, like, three three months, four months where I'm able to stay at home with my newborn baby. Like I can do that. Like I don't have to go back and forth to six weeks, you know, barely recovered, like not even fully recovered. Like I can take that time. Mm -hmm. Um, so that was one thing that was really important to me was like when establishing my practice, I was establishing systems for me to have healthy boundaries from the get go. Sure. Yeah. Um, so that helps a lot. Being able to have a manageable caseload and stuff helps yeah. a lot. Um, and like, I, I don't mean to pry, but I'm oh. curious. Uh, like, what does that mean for you? So like, for example, for me, like I don't see clients on Wednesdays and that's the mm-hmm. first time in my career where I haven't worked five days a week. And like, even that opened up a lot of opportunity for self-care and stress relief for me. So like, I'm not looking for a number, I guess, but just to help maybe younger therapists or people in the, in the profession who are, who are untangling some of this for themselves. Like what is a manageable case light caseload actually look like for you? Yeah. So it does fluctuate a bit, especially now that i am um, been fully licensed for five years. I yeah. don't have to ask my question of like, do I want to do more of a supervisory role or like a client load? And since I'm slowly coming back from maternity leave, mm-hmm. um, I'm reevaluating all of that, but in yeah. general, like before, you know, the maternity leave, um, my rules were I worked four days a week, three days I was seeing clients, one day was like admin or like supervision calls, that kind of stuff. Yeah, for sure. Um, and then I wouldn't see any clients past ideally five o'clock, realistically six o'clock. Yeah. It was like, I'm not a good therapist if I see someone at six or later. <laughs> like I know. So it's like, for me, like when I know that I'm not doing my best work, that was a note to myself. Like, okay, seeing a client at seven, my brain is gone. Yeah, right. <laughs> it's left the building. I'm not showing up for my client. So mm-hmm. it was, it, I'm a middle of the day person. I get most of my work done in the middle of the day. If it's too early, no, too late, no. So like I sell most of my clients between like 10, 11 o'clock to about like, I normally finish up around six, five yeah. or six. Yeah. Um, and that's what worked for me. Right. So, and yeah. then I'm making sure I like scheduled in a lunch break. <laughs> yeah. Well, no. And, and I'm asking specifically, cause again, there, there isn't a prescriptive nature to this, but I love your feedback on like, it is what worked well for you. Yeah. And like understanding that if we as therapists treat ourselves as regular human beings, that like when we take care of ourselves first, we provide better care for our clients. Yeah. And it's always funny. Cause I, I always say like, I give what my expectations are for myself is what I give to like my staff and stuff. So it's really funny. Cause like when they'll first start working with me, they're so used to being like, okay, so I'll be available Monday through Friday, 8am to 5pm. When I've told them I'm like, Hey, you get to pick your schedule. Yeah. This is, you know, the minimum amount of hours I want you to week work, which mm-hmm. is like way attainable. Um, <laughs> and then, you know, you fill in those hours and then they'll give me their hours. I'm like, I don't care. You put in your schedule what you want. Why are you working this huge gap? Why yep. are you doing that? Do you have a break here? Do you have a break there? And they're like, oh, like it's like it's like a lot of unlearning that happens. Right. Um, because we're taught to basically, you know, nine to fives are the ideals five days a week. And yeah. It's not. Grab a snack in between session and mm-hmm. see your next client right away instead of like taking a lunch break. That sounds yeah. so simple and obvious, but a lot of therapists aren't scheduling time for stuff like that. You like to do yoga in the middle of the day? T- take a break to have, right. like, take some time to have a yoga class or what have you. Like, yeah. I don't care as long as you know you're showing up and doing your work and you feel satisfied with that. That's all that matters to me. I'm like, I always joke, I'm like, I've got too much going on in my own brain to like micromanage myself let alone somebody else (laughs) yeah for sure um but yeah so going back to like your self-care stuff like that's what i do on the business side in my personal life um yeah i mean we have our dog uh she she comes in with me once a week and Mm -hmm. hangs out with our clients and people really seem to like her Her name's frankie she's a three-year-old black golden doodle so I love taking her on walks her and the baby um going on walks like yeah it's, it's a little bit of a circus to try to get everything together but you know it works out 
Yes. Um, yeah, and um, I have ADHD, so my, my special interests change a lot. Uh, I did, like, crocheting for a while. Right now I've been doing a lot of reading books and reading um, – funny story right now don't ask me what the author's name is sure um but it's a popular book that's out right now yeah. um and then i do um aerial lira is probably like my biggest like like exercise thing that i do which yeah. is um for those who don't know it's a hoop that you hang up and it's like aerial dance so like you do different moves and stuff there's other things like people are probably used to like silks like um people might confuse it for um aerial yoga Mm -hmm. um but then you can do like stagnant trapeze that kind of thing so um that's always been fun it's always been really it's hard for me to stick to like a sport or like a you know something that like moves your body yeah and this one always has because it provides enough dopamine. Like, I'm like, oh, okay, I completed this new thing. Yay, this is really exciting, but it's also challenging enough for me to stick with it. So yeah. I've done that for almost two years now. Awesome. Um, Very cool. Yeah, and I did that all the way into my beginning, my third trimester of pregnancy, which was something. <laughs> hey. Yeah, I love um, Frankie's adorable. I mean, Frankie's oh, on, gosh, on your I website. Yeah. <laughs> I love, we, we have a office dog here who doesn't come into therapy with me, but like animals are really great for getting some dopamine, getting some physical mm-hmm. contact throughout the day without necessarily being overstimulating or overbearing. Um, and like, I don't know, being a new parent, but like my, mine are six and three and like looking back on like some of those things where it was like the difference between when I was, I was in high ride at the time, but still doing mental health, um, when we had our first son versus second child where like I was opening my own practice, like so much more time at home, so much more time with my kid. Mm-hmm. Like that's so like, it sounds cliche, but like you don't get that time back. And so like having that work life balance shows up in so many different ways. It's not just the business side of things, but that translates into having more time for stress relief or having more energy, having more mm-hmm. dopamine, having more brain resources so that you can show up for the way that you want, or you can well, take your dog for a walk yeah. at the end of the day and like that stuff's really meaningful oh i'm so lucky that like even when like i'm fully back like full time it's not like a normal full time job and i said like one of the reason one of the things i was thinking about was that like i knew i wanted to have like a kid or two in the future mm-hmm. and i wanted to make sure that i could show up and that you know um i could be a part of that because they they just grow up, it's cliche, like you said, but like they just grow up so quickly. And <laughs> they do. I was never a baby person until I had my own and then like experienced like, oh, dang, they don't say small for very long. No. And it's so funny. You're like, oh, wow, you made that facial expression. That is so entertaining. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. Like everything they do is cool. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and yeah, I think there's, I don't know. There's so many there's so many social pressures on how to run a business or how to be successful and like then there's all this pressure on how to be a parent, how to be a mom, how to give mm-hmm. birth correctly and like all this bullshit societal stuff that like I think people struggle to navigate and one of the big reasons like I have the podcast and this other stuff is just that we're human too. There's nothing mm-hmm. special about us as therapists that means we don't have to take this stuff into consideration, try and balance it, figure out how to do it, prioritize certain things and not other things like our brains work the same as everyone else's just because we know the psychology information doesn't mean that it doesn't hit us the same way. Oh yeah. And you know, giving advice and taking advice are two different things too. So there's sometimes I'll be talking with my clients. I'll be giving them advice. I'm like, girl, you need to take your own advice right now. Like, come on. Like, yes. (laughs) Like you said, we're human. We fall out of habits and like, I'm very open with the fact that like I go to therapy too. Mm -hmm. Um, sometimes a little bit more frequently, sometimes just for like, you know, management and it's helpful for me. And, you know, I think it's also normalizing. Like I tell my clients, like, you know, I do therapy too. Like this is a normal thing to me. I see it as like taking your car into like the mechanic, right? Like, you take care of it so it lasts longer and goes longer and you know it has you can you know enjoy it yeah i'm like enjoy life enjoy the things that you're doing i talk about 
mental health is not any different than physical health. Your brain's part of your body. And so we can't treat mental health as like this separate entity. Like we fuel our, our body with food and exercise. Mm -hmm. We rest regularly with sleep. Like our brain needs that stuff too, because our brain is part of our body. And so we can't skip that stuff. We can't treat mental health as if like we can magically willpower our way through it because it's just part of our body, just like everything else. No. And I would never expect anybody else to power through what they're going through so why would i expect that of myself right yeah yeah <sighs> fuck societal norms right um <laughs> this is why i have neurodivergent therapists on so i mean like yeah, yeah the structure sucks don't do it that way do what works for you oh yeah it's it's so funny it just makes like in everything like even like it drives my um grandma crazy because like there'll be a tradition that she'll hold on to so tight i'm like why grandma Makes you miserable. Makes everyone else miserable. Why are we doing this? Because it's tradition. I'm like, that's stupid. Yeah. Yeah. Her and I have that relationship where I was like, that's stupid, Grandma. Yeah. And she's like, ah, well, it's my stupid thing. And I'm like, <laughs> fair, but I don't know how much effort I'm putting into it. Um, Taylor, if, if people want to learn more about your work or work with you or find out about your practice, where do they go? How do they find your information? Yeah, so you can go to... Um, our website, which is Nova, N-O-V-A, M as in Mary, H-S, um, so Nova Mental Services, dot com, and so it's Nova M-H-S, sorry, I didn't want to confuse that, dot com, um, and there's a bunch of information on there, um, we have bios for all of our therapists on there, as well as like contact forms, uh, so it's just kind of like our good one stop shop yeah we also have an instagram mm -hmm. i believe our handle is at nova mhs as well there might be a dash in there i don't know we'll um, have it linked in yeah, the show there notes we go. we'll link it there <laughs> we go um and same with our facebook yeah. yeah awesome yes we'll have all those useful links down in show notes so people can find it thanks so much for taking the time to come yeah. on and chat today yeah thank you so much for having me this is great and to all our wonderful listeners, thanks so much for tuning in. We'll be back next week with another new episode. Take care, everyone.